Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's Syria Security Seminar. Thank you all for being here. So we are really pleased to have Dr. Santiago Torres Arias speaking virtually today. He will talk about uh, practical software supply chain security and transparency. So Santiago's current research focuses on securing the software development lifecycle. Previously, his research focused on secure password storage mechanisms and update systems. He is the team lead of InToto, a framework to secure the software development lifecycle, as well as Poly Password Hasher, a password storage mechanism that's incredibly resilient to the offline password cracking. So he also contributes to the update uh, framework, which is the software update system being integrated on variety of projects such as Docker and others. So Santiago, thank you so much for joining, joining us today. Please take it away. Great, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, as Rekay was talking about, uh, I mostly care about how can we produce software securely and how can we consume software securely. Um, on the like global notion, we call this software supply chain security. Today, I'm going to be talking about exactly how can we do this in a practical sense. Um, just to, to quickly uh, wrap up what we're going to be talking about, I am going to talk about what exactly is a software supply chain and how can they get compromised. Uh, then we're going to go uh, on a like bottom-up uh, approach and we're going to see how we can protect uh, critical software that's used in the software development lifecycle. Then how can we tie all of the security policies and all the security mechanisms together using a framework that I built called Intoto uh, and then we're going to see how we can use all of this information to create a global ledger of software supply chain meta information. Um, and finally, we're going to talk about uh, essentially what you, what you can do when you know all of what's happening in the software supply chain, which is called uh, software supply chain intelligence. Um, you may have seen a lot of work on uh, uh, dependency confusion and uh, maybe typo squatting. That's the type of uh, work that relates to software supply chain intelligence. So to kick up the talk, I'm going to actually derail a little bit. Uh, let's talk about Maslow's pyramid of, uh, of needs. In this case, I'm going to call it Maslow's pyramid of supply chain security. The reason why I talk about it in this way is because um, it really conveys very well what exactly uh, we're getting at when we're trying to practically protect the software supply chain. Uh, in Maslow's original pyramid of needs, we would have the fundamental needs, the physical things like being, having shelter and having food, and then the more uh, like humanistic notions like uh, self-actualization, learning, philosophy were at the top, but you couldn't take care of the top ones if you didn't take care of the bottom ones. So to bring this back into the software supply chain security world, this is exactly how a pyramid of supply chain security looks in the Maslowian terms. It would start with something called step security, which is each individual step in the development lifecycle and the supply chain needs to be individually secured. Then you will take care about uh, what we call interstep security. How can you connect two steps and make sure that both of, uh, both are aware of each other's security policies so that you, they can be protected of, um, of uh, artifact transfer or artifact flow. Um, then we're going to talk about interchain security, which is uh, essentially the dependency question. How can you uh, consume software from somebody else and make sure that they're actually, uh, their supply chain is actually uh, not malicious? And at the end, uh, once we build all of this information, we can start answering uh, in a trustworthy fashion uh, supply chain intelligence questions. Again, can we actually trust this dependency? Can we actually create policies about the consumption of uh, software based on legal uh, precedents uh, and so on and so forth? But before I go into the software world, I also wanted to talk uh, about uh, supply chains in general, just to uh, set the tone of the conversation. So, a supply chain uh, is mostly centered about how can we create a product. In this case, I have a bottle of Tylenol, and this bottle of Tylenol was uh, produced by following a series of steps. We had a bunch of suppliers that created raw materials. They eventually gave this materials to a manufacturer that either sent their materials to a repackager or a distributor, and then it eventually, after going through all of these pipes, it ends up in a pharmacy or a hospital, in which you can walk in, you can ask for your uh, Tylenol bottle, and then you get your bottle of Tylenol that you can consume to fix your headache. 
Now, this is a security talk, so you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that for blockchain, compromises actually happen, not, not only in the software world, but in the real world as well. Uh, is anyone familiar with the uh, Chicago Terminal murders? It's going to be hard to do a raise of hands. Uh, so I'm assuming there is no raise of hands. Well, this was something that happened in 1982 in which somebody broke into a pharmacy, actually just walked into the pharmacy, opened the bottle of Tylenol and then sneaked a little bit of cyanide on the bottle and then just put it back in the counter. Uh, when, what ended up happening is uh, other customers walked into the pharmacy, they opened the bottle, they consumed the Tylenol and some of them died. This was a very gruesome uh, event and something that actually shaped the way that we produce and consume pharmaceutical products to this day. Um, nowadays, you see a Tylenol bottle and you know that there's a lot number that's used to manage recalls in case there's something wrong with, wrong with the ingredients. You will find things such as an expiration date at the bottom of the bottle. Oh, so you know if something is expired, not to consume it anymore because it may be dangerous or it may be not effective. And you have things such as tamper proof seal, which is exactly what happened after the Tylenol murders, which is so we now we need to know that nobody tampered with the product between the manufacturer and the consumer. The pharmacy was just a transfer mechanism. So now, having said all this and understanding a little bit about we're, what we're talking about, let's uh, let's think about how would it happen on a software supply chain. So, a software supply chain is something like this. This is a very simple software supply chain that it's what I call the GitHub generation software supply chain. Uh, if you're using GitHub, you're probably pushing your code using Git to some Git hosting platform. Uh, then you probably have uh, some build uh, system somewhere. It could be your laptop. It could be a build farm. Then eventually you run it through a packaging process. Again, it could go from your laptop to a big packaging uh, pipeline. If you're feeling fancy, you're probably running a, a CI uh, mechanism over your code to make sure that everything's correct. Um, and in the same way that uh, supply chains work, uh, we will eventually end up with a package, a bottle of Tylenol or Debian package, a Microsoft uh, Office installer. That is essentially our final product. Now, you wouldn't be surprised that uh, software supply chains also get hacked in the same way that the Tylenol murders happen. Uh, there was a uh, very big incidents like uh, the Juniper security uh, compromise in which somebody broke into their version control system and they flipped a uh, sort of random C generation code so that every single connection of, uh, of certain products of Juniper was easily man-in-the-middle. Somebody could actually just decrypt all of the conversations and even pretend to be uh, different endpoints on this particular firewall. And well, this is not the only time that somebody has actually broken into a virtual control system to do all sorts of malicious and scary things. Um, and this is not exclusive to the, uh, to the virtual control system or to the code infrastructure. This can happen to a build uh, server. Uh, one example that I like a lot is Xcode Ghost in which somebody uh, essentially distributed a um, factoring version of Xcode that eventually ended up uh, being on Angry Birds. So if you were playing Angry Birds around 2015, you probably were part of a big uh, uh, compromise that was trying to steal everybody's credit card information. That's how scary things get. Of course, as I was saying before, this is not an isolated incident. This is not only exclusive to version control systems or build systems. This actually also happens in packaging infrastructure. Um, here, I like another example that's related to uh, how can you be clever, how attackers are actually clever in the way that they compromise individual aspects of the infrastructure to target individual uh, people out there in the wild. Um, this case is somebody broke into a mirror server in Korea, in South Korea, and distributed a malicious version of uh, PHP MyAdmin, which is a, it's a, a tool to manage PHP uh, installations. Now, the interesting bit of this is that it can, it sheds some light on how uh, a state actor can possibly do a software supply chain compromise to attack a political enemy. Uh, in fact, in this one case, people claim that it was uh, North Korea that was causing this, uh, this particular attack. We actually, I don't think we ever knew, and this is also part of why supply chain compromises are so, uh, so scary because it's very hard to know who exactly did these things. Uh, I'm sure you've had some, uh, conversations about cyber attribution, especially when you cover the legal aspects of, uh, of cybersecurity, but it, it's, it really is a challenge. 
Uh, again, this is not an isolated incident. This has been happening for years and years and years, um, ever since I started my uh, graduate studies. Finally, there's also questions about compliance. Uh, you can have a CI system like you, or you can have things such as a QA uh, individual not doing their actual QA. Uh, this is another example. Windows 7 was pu uh, published an update in which if you did install it, it would break your computer, fully break the computer. Um, everybody thought that this was originally a software supply chain compromise. And after an internal investigation, Windows, well, Microsoft uh, realized that somebody just took a test update and published it without going through all of the controls that are usually necessary to publish uh, an update of Microsoft Windows. Again, this is not an isolated incident. I am not trying to point fingers. This happened in a very, very similar way to the Linux kernel. Uh, but just to stop uh, after the first uh, 12 minutes of this class, I took the liberty of taking uh, our very silly software supply chain uh, and I added a bunch of little devils to pretty much label where points of compromise could happen. And even in a very, very simplistic, again, the GitHub generation, we say it mockingly, uh, there is many points in which a single compromise can completely subvert the final product. And that is exactly what we're trying to face uh, when, we're, uh, when we're trying to tackle the, the software supply chain security problem in a practical way. So, oh, and just to put the stakes higher, there was a, uh, I'm going to get to this question, just wanted to acknowledge it, Jay. But yeah, uh, just to put the stakes higher, there was a hearing last year about how uh, software supply chain information could be uh, relevant to, uh, to election integrity. Well, and, and it is. Uh, the software that's on the voter machines needs to be sourced from proper uh, sources. And uh, well, I don't need to say this, but uh, because uh, it's starting to get tiring, but everybody's talking about, uh, uh, about solar winds. And, it really is. It really is a very devastating attack that made it into the kitchen of every single, uh, every single uh, agency and high, uh, highly ranked corporation in this country. Now, the image is a scream as like people are thinking that this is inevitable and we cannot fix this problem in a meaningful way. So let's just get insurance and forget about the problem. Now, I am thinking that we can do something else. We can try to build again, Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, on the software supply chain by essentially building a all-encompassing notion of uh, software as it is produced and how um, as it is consumed. So to do this, we essentially need to build strong links and build a chain of strong links. Uh, again, a supply chain is just a chain. So starting from the bottom, again, I was talking about step security. Uh, Step security is the very, very foundational element of software supply chain security, which is how can we make this strong links, as I was uh, just mentioning. Now, there is many good point solutions, and uh, the goal is not to replace them, but rather be able to communicate this to each individual party in the chain. Uh, to give some example, there's uh, SDN, CES, and Git signing. There's uh, things such as push certificates. I actually did some work on uh, with the Git community to try to to prevent certain types of attack on Git. Uh, on the build system level, you have things such as TPM, which can use measure boot to check the integrity of the host or HSMs to actually uh, control signing keys. We saw that this was not uh, enough on, uh, on the SolarWinds case. So we, needed, we need something like verifiable compilers or reproducible builds so that we can make sure or make a, at least a, a probabilistic uh, argument that uh, not every single host that's building uh, this particular version of, uh, of the uh, SolarWinds agent is compromised. And for packaging, there's very well-known solutions like TLS for the distribution, GPG for signing long-term releases, or even TOP, which is a little bit more elaborate. I am very happy to be working on TOP for many, many years now. I am happy that it's part of the PyPy uh, working group right now. I am very happy that it graduated from the Cloud Native GP Foundation. Uh, two years ago now. So taking it from the previous, uh, from the previous uh, image that had a bunch of little devils, uh, if we implement all of this, all of these solutions, we can take away some of the, some of the problems, but th there's still a, a question of how do I know each individual step is performing their operations properly 
again, how do I know that the git signing is used in this particular fashion or who do I, uh, or who do I trust to sign this commits in this particular organization? Uh, and when I'm about to build this code, do I know that this is the latest tag that I should be building? And uh, the same uh, goes for packaging. Is the result of this build the one that I should be inputting into my package or just any, any other? Uh, and so on and so forth. So there's gaps between steps. There's a way that we need to connect all of the security policies together. And then there's a question of compliance. How can we enforce that the security policies are actually followed? So this takes us to the second uh, element of the Maslowian pyramid, uh, pyramid of supply chain security, which is this interest that security. And that's exactly why I built in Toto. Now, before moving forward, I want to stop and answer Jay's question. I'm going to read it to everybody. Uh, could the argument uh, uh, could the argument be made that Xcode Ghost actually demonstrated the correct function of, of Apple's App Store? Yes, it demonstrated relatively low bar for entry into the store, but once the thing was discovered, it was immediately made unavailable. In practice, Apple's approach has provided very high level of entry while still supporting thousands of users on Apple apps. Yes, uh, that is the, the question is how can we prevent this from happening? Uh, and yes, definitely. I, I am not. Uh, I am not trying to point fingers at any single customer or vendor, for that matter, but rather point the challenges and how all of these individual software components come to play into producing a app or a, any sort of product, and how Apple cannot uh, individually take care of all of these problems. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit more about this when we get into the interchange security aspect, but. Um, that's essentially the challenge that if uh, Apple is tasked with gatekeeping all of that comes in, they don't have a lot of visibility on what happened before it actually uh, was built into, uh, into an individual package, but rather just the last mile as the, it was produced and signed with developer certificates that were given by the people who built the individual apps. Um, so going back, um, so Within Toto, what we're trying to do again is then provide a way to communicate the software supply chain uh, elements so that we uh, can know exactly, uh, exactly who's doing what in the supply chain and that we can create a policy so that we can enforce all these uh, individual per step policies. So, so going back to our software supply chain, basically what we need to do is uh, indicate the the individual actors within the chain. So that if say Dave is compromised, we can still follow a trusted path from Bob's uh, code to Carol's build to Warren's packaging. Uh, this principle is a very uh, old time security principle, which is role separation. And the consequence of this is that the system is compromised resilient. The other principle that is also again, fundamental on, on security is also uh, uh, key revocation and uh, yeah, key revocation and uh, enrolling new users in the system in an invalid way. So we also want to, when we don't trust Dave anymore, we want to replace Dave with Ada, so that we know that Ada now is running the tests properly and they're not lying about the about what they're actually doing. So we are bootstrapping from a compromised state that's compromised resilient into one that's actually able to recover into a fully trusted state. We also want to build a system that's tool agnostic. Uh, I frequent many uh, open source developer circles and I know that for example, in the neo mod community, uh, well actually the old mod community, they used to use Mercurial, which is a different uh, version control system. And if you look into the intrinsics, um, they actually don't share a lot of the concepts. They, they make share tags, they make share branches, but there are small nuances between them. So what we're trying to build is a tool that can let you represent all of the different steps that can be taken in a software supply chain. Uh, when you do this, you can build a system that's all encompassing. Uh, when I say all encompassing, uh, I'm going to do a little thought exercise. Uh, is This is what the software supply chain it looks like today, but we don't know what's going to come afterwards. We don't know if there are steps that are going to be, are going to be happening before the version control system, and we don't know if there's going to be other things that are going to be branching off of a typical supply chain. To take, take things into a little bit uh, crazy, I have a collaborator, um, Gaba, she, she's at the University of Connecticut. She could be publishing a paper and using security to authenticate every single keystroke. 
and uh, somebody could come up with a hypnotizing attack then that makes people actually type uh, malicious code into their version control system. We also want to protect this. So we could have somebody uh, create an alpha wave reader to detect people's intentions so that we know that they're actually intending to write that code. We also want to protect that part of the software supply chain. Again, we try, we're trying to build an all-encompassing all system. Uh, by doing this, we end up with a very expressive system that allows us to represent every single software supply chain out there. I haven't found a single one that is not representable using Intoto intrinsics. Um, I've been working with uh, Debian packaging teams, uh, working with uh, Tails and QSOS into building a secure ISO, using the position build semantics. Uh, I am part of the Arch Linux uh, security team, and I also work with the release engineering team. Uh, and one uh, example that I'm going to talk about is the data dog integration, which is uh, one that I'm very excited about. Uh, it's been a couple of years now, but uh, I think they're doing a fantastic job securing their supply chain. So by having this uh, expressive system, and I'm going to explain how it actually works, we're actually able to represent all of the operations that are related to producing software in the wild. To do this, it's actually not really that hard. Um, we need to essentially tackle three problems. How can we verifiably describe all of these steps, the ones that I was just drawing? Um, how can we assign uh, actors to each individual uh, um, step in the chain and finally provide a way to tightly bind this, uh, this element so there's no tampering on the way. So to do this, we essentially created a, a DSL, a domain specific language that allows you to describe exactly this in a policy language. Um, you describe the steps, you assign um, individual actors to, uh, to the steps by, by means of their public keys. Um, and then you register what you're expecting each individual step to produce. Uh, some of them may produce source code, some of them may uh, produce a binary, some of them may produce assets like an image or a script or a localization file. It could be anything in the world. Finally, using this DSL, we're able to tie all of these things together and essentially draw what we call artifact flow integrity, which is a property that we're trying to preserve as, uh, as we're producing software. Finally, in order to give a, a rubber stamp over this policy, the project owner of a project will sign this so we uh, have a root of trust over this individual subset of uh, a project's supply chain. Now, once we know what needs to happen, we uh, created a bunch of tools to let people uh, essentially report what happened. So uh, we created this uh, wrapper and a bunch of plugins for Kubernetes, for Jenkins, for Tecton. Uh, a bunch of community uh, created uh, stuff that essentially lets you create a, an attestation of what you did. So if you are checking in code, you can say, well, I created this commit. If you are building something, you can say, I took this commit in and this is what I produced. So then to check what uh, that uh, software supply chain hasn't been compromised, we essentially allow people to take a bunch of attestations and this policy build a graph of artifact flow, and then compare it to uh, the policy as it was described. And we turn the whole question into a graphism problem. This is just like the academic uh, side, uh, side note. So now, just to quickly go over how this would work. Again, we know that an attacker cannot steal a uh, assigned uh, layout unless they compromise the key uh, of, the, of whoever publishes the policy. That's essentially being able to get uh, access to, say, a root CA. Uh, we know that uh, in the policy, we indicate that all steps need to, need to happen. And we also know who needs to perform them. So uh, they can authenticate each individual action. Uh, if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about the security degradation of uh, the security properties, that's, uh, that's spoken about in the paper. But I, I want to get to the rest of the content. Um, and finally, by using artifact hash chaining, which is essentially how do you uh, knit things together, we're able to make sure that things are not uh, tampered on the way. Now, this is a system that I am very excited to know that it's being deployed in a bunch of different places. The one that I'm the most excited about is Datadog, which is in turn used by a bunch of different data companies. Uh, and Datadog really wants to protect the way that they're producing the software that's installed as root in the clouds of all of this. Uh, of all of these companies. So to do this, they are essentially creating the, 
creating what they call a a trustless CI. CD. Uh, what they do is they gave every single developer a hardware token in which they can sign every single line of code that they write. And this creates a series of attestations that can be used to track the code all the way into the agent. So the agent needs to know each line of code as it was written by somebody known on the, on the Datadog building in the New York Times, uh, well, the New York Times building in the Datadog offices. Uh, you can read more about it on this uh, blog post that they wrote. Now, we checked this against a bunch of uh, the compromises that I was showing earlier and different situations that we have uh, within Toto. And well, it turns out that you can actually protect against uh, many, many uh, of the software supply chain compromises out there, depending on your configuration on this policy, you may or may not be protected uh, against all of them. We also checked uh, how efficient it is. Well, nothing in the, in the world is free, but generally you get a 20 to 30% uh, increase in the metadata cost, which is just storage of this uh, uh, side information that uh, relates to how the supply chain practices were carried out. We also found a bunch of uh, interesting factoids, like uh, if you are packaging Cisco uh, code, you need to keep a bunch of different uh, binary images for uh, test assets, which makes uh, the metadata really bloated. So now we essentially got to the second level of the pyramid. Now we're trying to get to the third level, the more like uh, interesting bits, which is how can we actually secure all of this world of different chains that uh, relate to each other? Again, talking about the Xcode problem, how do we, uh, how are we able to ensure that the Xcode is actually Xcode and it was the one that was given to me and how can I report that information forward down the line? So what we're doing here is uh, building uh, an auditable data structure for software supply chain security. Uh, for those that are familiar with it, uh, we're using a transparency log. For those that are not really familiar with it, it's a, essentially a blockchain uh, without the consensus algorithm, but more of a different trust assumption using uh, delegating the trust to a series of auditors that are almost like miners, but a little bit more cheaper. And the idea is to essentially allow you to replace this root of trust so you can, uh, over time, publish who's publishing what. Um, you can also update policies for individual runs of the software supply chain. So you can say version one was done this way, version two is done this other way. And finally, to, uh, to answer the most interesting bits, which is to identify this software inter interdependency problem. Uh, this is work that I'm doing with uh, Red Hat, Google, and Microsoft. Uh, if you're interested in, see in seeing how the Microsoft uh, people are working on it, there's an RSA comp uh, last year that uh, showcased how Toto is used. I recommend you take a look at that. Uh, but the more interesting bit is uh, a project that we just announced on March 11, which is Sixdoor, uh, a this transparency log that I was talking about. Um, the basic idea is that in Sixdoor, you are trying to create this global notion of different software supply chains. Now, we know that many pieces of software are built differently and they are connected to each other in different ways. You may be building software that's actually used to build something else later down the line. Just to simplify the image, maybe you have GCC, and I think that this is the logo for Automake or Ninja, I forget. And then you have Git and, and now PKG for building a package that eventually becomes the Linux kernel running in your machine. So the basic idea is that as uh, software supply chain is happening, you are putting these entries on the log and think of it as a blockchain and linking them together to say, well, I built GCC, now I am building uh, Git and by using, by, uh, when building Git, I am actually using this version of GCC that was down on the log. Uh, when you do this, you can essentially allow customers to say, download the package, uh, go into the log, and then uh, start walking down and verifying individual supply chains as they are connected to each other to eventually get this uh, very uh, strong assurance that everything was followed properly. Um, just wanted to acknowledge two questions. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. The other cool thing that uh, you can do when you have this global notion is that you can do things such as propagate defects. Uh, there's this very cool example that uh, very recently working on a Saturday evening. Uh, I am also working on the external security team as I was uh, mentioning. And uh, essentially there was a critical vulnerability that, affect, that may have destroyed a bunch of different uh, projects out there. So 
the interesting bit of this low level electricity, you will find that it's related to thinking pills, is that it actually affects one particular uh, project. In case, in this case, was uh, been utils to 2.36, uh, but actually maybe it was a fake root issue as dependent on being utils. So maybe it applies to somebody, something else down the line. Actually, by doing some local testing, well, you may actually be also uh, interested in knowing how GLIT C becomes part of the problem. And uh, wait, it's actually not about GLIT C. It's an issue with a kernel that is running using a new version of a stat, a stat system called, called UFS stat act. Uh, so just to recap, uh, this vulnerability causes a bunch of different problems. GLFC may be involved, bin utils definitely involved, fake root as compiled with these two libraries may be buggy. Uh, and the result of this is that any build system that is using fake root to build packages, which is basically all of them in terms of the Linux ecosystem, may produce binaries with the wrong permissions. So anybody that was using this tool chain that compiled anything for anybody compiled this, uh, compiled packages that had uh, essentially things that were owned by everybody, things with permissions pretty much 777. So with, uh, with something like uh, six door, you could do this uh, third party attestation in which you can attach this vulnerability to bin utils and then start following this, uh, this chain of consequences. So you can say, well, bin utils, bin utils is really the problem, but really, really the problem is all of the things that were built with the utils. And we need to convey this sort of information in a, in a meaningful way. And this is of course, not only related to CVEs, but it's actually just to communicate that information to, to anybody that's a consumer. This can be a, uh, a legal takedown notice, or this can be a security review by a third party uh, auditor, or this can be a FIPS compliance team walking and taking a look at your code and eventually creating a, a, an attestation saying this particular piece of code is text compliant. Uh, it can be anything else really. So finally, once you have this uh, essential global notion of all of the software that is produced out there and uh, you are able to connect it, uh, connect it all, you can start uh, asking the more philosophical questions. Again, uh, going back to the supply chain intelligence question. Uh, one, uh, one question that I, uh, well, one example that I use to convey this software supply chain intelligence problem is the left path index, or well, left path incident, which is um, essentially somebody on uh, the NPM ecosystem just took down a package, was a bunch of, uh, a couple of lines of code to add things to the left of a uh, to the left of a string, and that broke everybody's package because everybody was depending on it. So to put it graphically, this is the Arch Linux. Uh, repositories. And I think this is just extra and core, not the, not all of the community stuff. Uh, it is a very, very hard to navigate, uh, very, very highly connected dependency graph. And what we're trying to answer uh, with something I'm building uh, uh, a supply chain monitor is, well, can we identify things such as the left pad uh, package in this very, very highly connected graph. And can we detect them uh, before they happen? And can we actually stop these compromises from taking place uh, before they actually take place by taking a look at this global notion of artifacts as they're flowing through the chain? Uh, this is something, again, that we're working with Sixdoor. Uh, I am building the first, uh, the first monitor of many that we hope that are deployed uh, related to the Sixdoor uh, ecosystem. Uh, this is, by the way, a VIP project for those of you, of you that are trying to look for the ID projects. That's exactly what we're trying to answer here. And for this, uh, I am thanking you and I am open for questions. Uh, I'm also leaving some con contact information for the different communities. You can always reach out to me with an email or, or yeah, or on Twitter. You can really reach out to me in many, many ways. I'm also on IRC and a bunch of slacks. Um, so, Krasimir Spetsanov, I hope I pronounced it properly. Uh, what do you think about the Satyrian backdoors? I don't actually know what they are. Um, Sabri asks me, does there need to be any isomorphism between the build result graph and the policy? If the need is that build result uh, graph could carry additional tested information on branches that can be analyzed by other tools, 
Yes, that would be super neat. Uh, so I oversimplified the problem a little bit, but yes, uh, essentially you could have a subgraph that's the core information, and then you can wrap that around a, a bigger graph, uh, which is kind of what we're trying to do with Sextor, right? You have this core information, that's essentially what the vendor is telling you they're doing. And then this other attestations that you were talking about and like branches off, uh, but that is produced by the community to tell you and convey you information that the that the original producer is either not motivated to tell you or is either not able to answer. Uh, and I hope I'm answering questions. How do I know if I actually answer the question? Okay, it's the first time I use this platform. So I'm just clicking on John and uh, if not, you can ask again, I guess. Am I still here? Yep, you're still here. Uh, I see in the chat, Krazy um, said that the uh, Centrion hack is pretty much the exact same thing as Solar Winds. Okay, that was me. So, something that I will say, and uh, if you have found something, I maintain this catalog of uh, software supply chain compromises. Like when I started, nobody was doing this. Uh, so we essentially are trying to give a one-stop shop to people uh, to go and visit uh, and understand how these different compromises uh, are happening and to essentially build their like creative work type of, uh, uh, of research. If you want to submit a pull request here, I think uh, we'd be more than a thrill to, to add it. And, to recognize you for your contribution. Uh, this is a uh, part of the CNCF security uh, working group. And uh, yes, yeah, we should do this. I think with that, I uh, haven't seen any other questions. Going back here. Is there a way that I can, uh, no, okay. With any compiler teams for integration of Intoto? Not really. So uh, a lot of the work that we did on the compilation stage was collaborating with the Produce for Builds uh, community. Um, and there was a lot of uh, heavy lifting done there. Uh, I know that there was some uh, connection with the GCC teams. Uh, and I know that there's some, uh, like there's, there's a possibility of going that way. Uh, I know that other companies that I can't mention are also interested in doing something of that nature. Uh, but I actually, I don't think I have had the cycles to work on that. Uh, if you're interested in, investigating that i think i'd be more than uh, interested in like having a conversation maybe sharing some emails and uh see where that takes us All right, I believe, uh, are there any questions left? I think that's all for today. Uh, so Santiago, thank you so much. It was a super interesting talk. I enjoyed a lot. Um, yeah, hopefully, you know, like after this pandemic, uh, maybe you can give uh, some, you know, in-person presentation. All right. Yeah, I, I would love to. Uh, 
yeah, and uh, I think there's a lot of work out there to be done. So, uh, so yeah, I'm looking for any type, any hands that can help me try to answer this problem. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, joining for today's seminar, and hope to see you next week.